thank you. Thank you, Lee, and also thanks to my friends, um, Lionel and Kyle, for having me um, to this great meeting. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, uh, different ways to address the anterior column, um, both lateral um, uh, lumbar interbody fusion as well as lateral ALIF uh, through a less invasive approach. Um, having done a fellowship with Kevin Foley, I think he'd certainly get angry with me if I called this true minimally invasive surgery, but I think certainly being able to address the anterior column through a less invasive approach um, is what I'm gonna discuss today. Here are my disclosures. And starting with ALIF, just a little bit about the history of it. It was actually initially described in 1906 and eventually transitioned to a more um, approach, more similar to what we use now through the retroperitoneal exposure um, in both 28 and 1933, and ultimately moving into true anterior fusion starting in the 30s uh, through this approach and ultimately um, being used to treat different pathologies like we do today, degenerative disc disease, um, through both retroperitoneal and experimentation with transperitoneal approaches, ultimately leading to instrumentation first described in the, in the late 90s. And some advantages of using ALIF to, to treat the anterior column is there's no need for neural retraction, um, and also improved ability from coming from the front to um, to, to generate lordosis, also to increase disc height, and subsequently being able to increase foraminal height uh, through a variety of techniques. For example, here starting with a degenerative disease and ultimately dilating that disc space and being able to place a nice lordotic cage at L5S1. This is critical, and this has been mentioned a little bit earlier today, but the importance of L4 to S1, particularly in Kevin's case, where we're really trying to get that two-thirds of our lumbar lordosis from L4 to S1, and often being able to address this through anteriorly helps us accomplish that goal. For example, in a patient like this, this is a patient with a high pelvic incidence, needs a lot of lumbar lordosis for anatomic um, alignment, and, and often this is best treated, um, even if it's single level pathology, for example, this L5S1 spondylolisthesis through an anterior approach. Now you might notice here, this is a very large patient, um, w which leads me into the, the topic of my discussion today, which is Oh, the effects of obesity on complication profile in ALIF. And at UCSF, we are very interested in risk stratification, predictive analytics when it comes to these different approaches. Um, and as part of that, I, I recently published this paper with our group here looking at the impact of obesity on complications for patients that had ALIF. And this was a retrospective study of almost 1,000 patients. All the exposures were done by vascular surgery, which is our standard protocol at UCSF. And we dichotomize these patients into obesity or non, obese or non-obese patients based on a BMI of greater than or equal to 30. And we collected surgical details in complication profile, both intraoperative and, and postoperative. And those complications, are, they're what you'd expect from uh, the anatomic structures in this location, both vascular, uh, the ureter, ureter bowel, and then um, uh, a distribution of medical complications as well as neurologic. And what we found in our, in our group is there's actually a very high percentage of obese patients, almost 40%. And the more, majority of these patients had had some form of prior surgery, and it was typically being used to, to treat degenerative processes. T typically, these patients are getting two-level ALIFs, and we did have in our group a, a small percentage of transthoracic um, pay, uh, approaches, which ultimately we felt were a different group and those were excluded. And the mo majority of these patients did get posterior supplementation as part of their operation. So overall, a fairly high complication rate of any, of any, any kind in the perioperative period. And this was primarily driven by postoperative complications. We'll get into a little bit about that later. Um, and we did have long-term follow-up here. So we, we, started looking at what type of complications we were getting. And, and we noticed that there was an increased rate of complications as a patient got older, as they had a higher body mass index, one of our interests in, in respect to this study, and also in the obese patients, and also in patients that are undergoing ALIF for deformity surgery, we had a higher risk of complications there, as well as patients that were being treated for infection. So a patient like this, very similar to Kevin's case, a patient has sagittal imbalance, solid fusion, 
and ultimately need a large correction. This patient did have an ALIF, and it's kind of understandable that in these patients, older patients, revision surgery with deformity, they're going to have an increased risk of complications. And so when dichotomized again into obese and non-obese patients in the pure ALIF group, almost 900 patients, we found that, that obese patients obviously had a higher body mass index, they had more comorbidities and more diabetes, and slightly less deformity, but that was pretty close. And what we found is that they did have a higher complication rate, overall complication rate, when, when patients were obese undergoing an ALIF. And this was primarily being driven by post-operative complications. So more ileus, more wound healing complications, more infections. However, when we started looking at the severity of obesity, we didn't see any statistical differences, although we did see a tr trend towards more hematomas, as well as a trend towards more DVTs in these patients post-operatively. And when looking in a multivariate way at, at, at these predictors of complications, we did find that obesity was an independent predictor of complications. And lastly, what we were looking for was a BMI threshold. So above a certain body mass index, was there a significantly increased risk of complications to help with, um, uh, with, with predicting complications for these patients? And we found that when the body mass index hit 31, that was when there was a significantly increased risk of complications. And so the threshold that we reported in this study was a BMI of 31 for increased risk of complications. So overall, these patients, again, they have an increased risk of complications, mostly post-operative. And as such, obese patients, when we see them in the clinic, should be appropriately counseled that they're at increased risk of these problems if they have an ALIF as part of their surgery. And when doing surgery on these patients, we should pay close attention to wound closures. We should with all our patients. And lastly, and moving into the, to my next topic, it is one thing to consider that these patients may do slightly better when positioned in the lateral position. And so when doing a lateral ALIF at L5S1, this is the, um, the setup in the operating room. Um, this is me and my partner doing one of these. And as you can see in this picture on the right, that abdominal, the large abdomen in the obese patient falls away from, um, from your field and you can use gravity to your advantage. When doing this, there, it is a true muscle splitting approach when coming from a lateral, uh, lateral approach and p potentially generating less risk of, of hernia when doing these operations and also possibly less pseudo hernia when you come laterally um, to approach L5S1. Because again, we're using gravity, there's significantly less peritoneal retraction, possibly leading to less ileus in these patients post-operatively. And you still get a good midline view of the disc, wide disc exposure, and you're able to put a nice midline, ca mid midline cage when you're doing this positioned laterally. The, the second reason, in addition to treating obese patients this way, is I think it's also a nice way if you're planning on doing a lateral approach to the upper levels of the lumbar spine to be able to do this. Instead of doing a supine operation, then a lateral position, you can now do this um, L5, really um, L1 to, to S1, all from a single position lateral operation. This particularly becomes important when thinking about coronal balance um, being able to treat um, to treat selected patients from a lateral approach. And we do know that uh, from multiple studies, including this by the ISSG, that the um, uh, that that patients with persistent coronal malalignment after surgery do have um, an I increased uh, risk of um, uh, of of not hitting those those metrics that we're really interested in in getting them to. Now, when classifying coronal imbalance um, in 2016, Bao reported a, um, a, a three, uh, three, three ways of describing this, um, A, B, and C. Um, patients with, uh, with type A are actually coronally well-aligned. Type B, their, shift, their trunk is shifted to the um, side of their concavity, and type C is the opposite. And what they found was that type C was persistently malaligned. Now, Alekos, theologist who's talking next, he's, he looked at this um, retrospectively when he was a fellow and confirmed this. So type C patients are more persistently malaligned after surgery. Now, what does XLIF add to this? Our group at UCSF has studied this and found really good correction coronally after XLIF. And then when comparing this to either XLIF, ALIF, or all posterior, 
actually found that there were significant improvements when you treat this through an XLIF, and actually when looking at post-operative metrics, patients do slightly better, particularly with pain, in hitting that MCID if they have an XLIF as part of this. But when you look at patients that were treated either with XLIF or an all-posterior approach, what they found was increase in OR time, understandable, because these patients are typically undergoing a two-stage operation, and then actually a significantly increased risk of, of, of um, increased blood loss when they had an XLIF. Same thing, it's a second operation. And so this case of mine, I think, illustrates some of these benefits. So this is a patient who has a type B curve, so shifted towards the concavity, um, and also sagittal imbalance, and throughout the lumbar spine has some bridging osteophytes, so it's a fixed deformity, and I initially treated this with, with a multi-level lateral and um, broke those osteophytes. You can see good coronal correction using the XLIF. At L3-4, I did a um, ACR, which is a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but I was happy with this correction. Type B curve, the patient remains um, well-lined after surgery, and I was happy with the lordosis. Now, this patient is, is a different patient. This patient has a type C curve, is shifted in the direction of the convexity of, of their lumbar, lumbar curve. And when I, I did, did this in a similar fashion where I did an X lift um, and, and really tried to get that coronal realignment, but you can see afterwards, this patient remains a type C curve. And this is, this is exactly what has been shown in other studies, that those type C curves are very, very difficult to treat. And, um, and when, when doing a lateral for this, they can remain persistently undercorrected here. And this was recently studied uh, by Juan Uribe at, at Barrow in Arizona. Um, he was focusing mostly on lateral surgery, um, being treated subsequently with posterior percutaneous fixation, but also as you can see in that very bottom line, that again, good correction in the type A and type B curves, but in the type C curves that he's treating with multi-level X lift, these patients were end ending up persistently undercorrected. And here's an example of a patient um, uh, that, that we've devised different strategy treating here at, at uh, UCSF, my partner and I. And this, this is a patient who has uh, degenerative scoliosis. She has a type C curve. And what our concern was here is that if we were to overcorrect the thoracolumbar major curve, um, th then we, we perhaps would end up with that same thing where the patient still had a persistent type C curve undercorrected after surgery. And what we've moved to is a strategy where in, in this patient, she same thing, she has bridging osteophytes, really fixed coronal, um, coronal deformity. We can remove those osteophytes from a minimally invasive lateral approach, but to allow us the, the freedom of doing a, a, a good cr coronal correction is, well, actually, we won't put a cage in because that we, we feel that that cage may actually inhibit our ability to fully correct from the back. We'll put bone graft in, arthrodese through the disc space, again, from a minimally invasive lateral approach, and then ultimately do a posterior surgery with osteotomies and, um, and then ultimately end up with the correction that we want. And so this is a pre- and post-op imaging. We're happy, happy with, this, um, with the correction of this patient. Again, you can see that there, there aren't any cages through that um, thoracolumbar curve there, and, and that's where those releases, minimally invasive releases, were done, packed with bone graft, but we didn't put any cages in there. Okay, thank you very much.